Welcome to the Wolf Connection Podcast. I'm your host, John Kalfa. Let's talk about some wolves. Joining Stephen and I today as a longtime supporter, a long-term advocate, and a man of many careers, <laughs> uh, Miguel Rivera. Miguel, just go through some of the things. I don't want to botch the introduction. Just some of the, the, the careers that you, you have and you're currently doing right now uh, since you've been here uh, with us. I'd like to say greetings to all those that are listening. Um, again, I'm Miguel Rivera. And uh, let me see, I'm a musician by trade. Then I became a sound editor for uh, television and motion pictures. So I've been doing that, supervising sound editor. I'm also a mentor, a translator, and also a community ritual leader. Man, yeah. So, so you run the gamut. This is great. We got, I got two audio aficionados in here. I got Stephen <laughs> and you. <laughs> this is great. I probably worked on a lot of programs that you've watched and liked. So Yeah. <laughs> what, in, what instrument do you play? I'm a percussionist by trade. I think know. I knew that actually. Yeah, because you're a percussionist by trade too, right, Stephen? You're oh well, no, guitar is definitely guitar's my first trade. instrument. Okay. But I play percussion when I, you know, need to for production and songwriting purposes. But yeah, yeah, guitar mainly. <laughs> That's awesome. That's right. Uh, so Miguel, I just I want to start just on your your background because you, like you said, you 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 come before we're starting. You you come from Guatemala. Just go through your background because you you came from a a doctor family, your mother and your father. And just so how did you get into the musicianship and then being, you know, a, a you know, a ceremonial leader? Yeah. As you do that? Uh, let me see. My father was a surgeon in Guatemala and then he decided to come to the United States to do a residency. And this is at a place called St. Francis in Jersey City. And this is 1947 or something like that. My mother was a nurse in the operating room. And so this is how they met. And my father, one of, one of the things that happened in our family, my grandmother and one of my aunts were born with cleft palate. So he mm. became a surgeon because he wanted to specialize in cleft palate restoration. So, of course, he married my mother and they, he did not want to live in the United States. So in 1949, they went back to Guatemala and that's where we were born. My father died in a very peculiar car accident in 1956. And so my mother, in his honor, decided to build a hospital in the back of the house where we lived. So the front of the house was a clinic with an X-ray room, waiting room, clinic, and then the back was like a <laughs> ten-bedroom hospital. Wow! So that, That's wild. All my life, I was basically in and around uh, surgeons Medicine, and yeah. doctors. Yeah, basically, anytime you somebody would knock on the door, they were either looking for the doctor or <laughs> bringing something back to the doctor. Like my father, they didn't charge people in those days. If people didn't have money to pay, they didn't charge. And so mm. there would be a knock on the door. I remember many times this happened. You would open up and there would be a basket of, of pro, with produce or chicken with eggs and stuff. So that's just how the people would pay it over the years. You know, all kinds yeah. of things would happen like that. My father died, like I said, in 1956. And my uncle, who was also a surgeon, took over the hospital in the clinic. So uh, when I was 8 or 9, 10 years old, I would go with him and do rounds in the hospital and I would go watch him do surgeries. I would do house calls with him. So wow, you were you were the you so, were the uh, ultimate assistant there. And I assume yeah. it's not like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. But I grew up with all that, you know. So I saw a lot of that. I learned in basically in watching my uncle work and my mother work, and from from the work that I knew of my father, because I was young when he died. But the stories that I would hear, if you're a healer, you're always looking for where the root of the disease is. Mm. So we moved to the United States in 1966 when I was 13. And in my last two years of high school, I decided to go work at a hospital in upstate New York, a small, very small hospital, like a 70 bed or something like the hospital. And so I was an orderly in an emergency room. And because I've been around, you know, healers all my life and surgeons, I could pull off being a resident. So people, would, they would leave me alone in the emergency room. And my job was to <laughs> administer first aid, take names, addresses, phone numbers of what was wrong and get on the phone and call the doctor. Wow. So a lot of times people would come into the emergency room and they would think that I was an intern and they would start talking to me about different things, you know. So about after two years, I worked one day on, one day off for two years straight. And after about two years of that, I realized maybe this is not my path. The interesting thing about that is... Uh, the surgeons that were working in the emergency room at the time were all studying to be psychiatrists, right? And so if you're if you're a healer, you're always looking for where the root of the disease is, you know? And so mm -hmm. these people in particular, and there were several of them, had decided that maybe it was not in the body, but it was someplace else. 
And the other thing that I learned by being in the emergency room, watching repetitive, uh, uh, repetitively what, why people would end up in the emergency room, is I saw terrible things happen to people or people do terrible things to themselves so they could be somewhere where they would be safe. Mm. Right? So I, that is in my mind. So I, I, left high, I left high school and I went to college and I decided to become something else. I ended up being a musician through <laughs> sheer coincidence. Wow. My cousin had a, a, a boyfriend that was Puerto Rican, so he taught me how to play congas. <laughs> this is in the 19, oh. early 70s in New York, you know, so we used to listen to Ray Barreto and Celia Cruz, Eddie Palmieri, the whole deal, you know, so I was very infused with all that kind of music. So I ended up in Colorado. I left New York on a dial circuit, ended up in Colorado, and I would go jam with people. All the time, and so uh, I ended up eventually. Eventually, I ended up uh, being asked to join a band, and the band that we were in was basically, oddly, interestingly enough, was all um, the music was all geared towards healing, you know. Mm-hmm. And long story short, eventually we ended up uh, getting signed to Capitol Records, right? And we were throughout touring, backing up a very famous singer in the United States at the time, and we were promoting one of our albums in New York City. Uh, we did a show at the Palladium. Mm. And then we finished, and uh, this young lady walks up to me and she goes, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And she goes, I want to thank you for saving my life. And I'm going, really? Uh, what did I do? And she goes, I was going to kill myself. Mm. And I was walking around the streets of Manhattan, and then I saw your album in the, in the record store, in the, in, the, in the window, and I decided to buy it, and that saved my life. So I want to thank you. So I realized that with the intention that the music in some form or another had created healing, and if I had only affected one person... In all my life, I realized I had done my job, you know. So with that in mind, I moved to L.A. because I was still living in Colorado. And as things would have it, you know, you have to diversify. And that time I was trying to um, support a family. And the music industry is up and down, and you have to figure out how to make a living. So in 1980, there was a huge actor strike. And so uh, all the musicians went out and supported the actors. So there was no session work at all available, and mm-hmm. I was dying for work. So I had friends that were working in a post-production house for television. And, and so I said, can you give me a gig? And they said, sure. So I ended up basically working on, started learning how to work on TV, uh, TV shows. And in those days, you, they, in, this particular, in this facility in particular, they would let you learn whatever you wanted to. It was a, one of the premier editing houses in L.A. at the time. This is 1980. So I learned all how to operate all the videotape equipment at that time. You know, two-inch machines, one-inch helical scan machines, and then... Luck, as luck would have it, I had already spent enough time in the recording studios that I could figure out what the audio path was for mm-hmm. post-production for television. And there was an opening in the audio department in Boom. I was in, you know, <laughs> working Man, on post-production stood- sound for TV. At the same time, still playing music. Around the yeah. same time, uh, there was a group of, uh, for, some, for some very strange, I got, I, got a, I got a call one time. From a friend of mine that had a recording studio in Topang, he said, "Hey man, I got." And this is how he used to talk. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, I got these chicks here. We got. We, we want some congas on these tracks. So come on over. So I said, "All right." So I went over there, and uh, the ladies they were recording Native American chants, but they wanted to make them uh, give them a little edge. So I overdubbed a bunch of conga tracks with these Native American chants. Wow. And so the tape that they recorded uh, basically was going to be promoted at this in- multicultural gathering, right, in Oxnard. And at that time, there was a bunch of all kinds of native elders were there. And I met people from different tribes and different traditions. And I ended up taking a liking to these particular uh, individuals named uh, Wallace Black Elk and Marcellus Williams, you know, and they end up, what they wanted to do is they were recruiting young people and they didn't care where, where, what the nationality they, they, um, they were from, but they wanted to teach what they knew what they knew to young people that were interested in learning. So I got introduced to Native American ceremonies and for uh, ceremonies and for about 15 years straight, we started with sweat lodge, then we went on to do vision questing and some of us went on to Sundance. So I was basically fasting and vision questing, right? And sun dancing and with also learning um, sweat lodge. And the whole, I did not understand exactly what they were after, but this is all in preparation for the anniversary of uh, Columbus's arrival in 1992, right? So it was a big deal. But what they were really interested in doing is basically saying, one time I remember we were getting ready to uh, go into the arbor to Sundance system at third or fourth year of Sundancing. And the intercessor said, you know, your people could not do this with us when they first came over 500 years ago. So on their behalf, you're doing it now. 
So it took me a long time to understand what that meant. But basically what they were teaching us how to do is how to recreate the coming together of the cultures. And with all the talk right now of all the cultural appropriation and basically all the wounding that's being exposed right now in current times, you realize that we need to recreate how the cultures came together originally with a, with a level of curios- curiosity and understanding what, what, what each race holds in particular. Each race has a medicine or a particular value, right? Mm-hmm. And when you come together in that way, it doesn't work until they all come together and represent. Man. So by recreating the coming together of the cultures the way it ought to have happened, we learn each other's songs, dances, customs, languages, right? And ways of praying. And you realize that they're all complementary. And this is the only way that this is going to work by everybody coming and representing from where they are originally and uh, connected to source. Through the years, I also became interested in poetry, you know, so I became uh, friends with a poet from Guatemala. His name is Humberto Acabal. He actually, unfortunately, he died in 2019. But he taught me a lot. Uh, by I was interested because I was doing men's retreats, and we were trans, uh, translating it. We used a lot of poetry to open up ways of communicating. And in one of his poems, he said this, Roots tell us through the flowers what the earth is like on the inside. Right? So when you connect to spirit that way in some source, you know, we all come from the same place. Mm. So we all are, come from that original void. <laughs> so when you go all the way back that way, yeah. nobody can argue with nothing, you know. So this is, <laughs> this is what we're, So that bypasses a lot of the uh, complications, right, and in, in, uh, confrontations that arise from modern times. Yeah. So uh, around 1990, after studying with my teachers for about 10 or so years, they said, okay, you can go out and start teaching people. I got invited to go to men's retreats through Robert Bly and James Hellman and Michael Mead. And I got interested, we got interested in working with youth. So in 1995, we started a, a mentoring pro, pro, uh, project here in LA called um, Shade Tree. And we had a group, a group of uh, maybe 15 or 20 young people in and out of gangs. Some of them were not in gangs, but the whole idea was to re, uh, create a rights of viable rites of passage. So for we've been looking for uh, how to create rites, rites of passage that are viable because that's one of the things that's that's really needed in the culture. But you can't have rites of passage until you have adults and elders in the culture. It's a prime example. You can see what's happening in the leadership right now in this country in particular, but in different parts of the world. The people in charge, they look like adults and they talk like adults, but they don't act like adults. And they look like elders. They talk like, they, they, they kind of seem like elders, but they're not elders. They're still... You know, they're acting more their shoe size than they are than their age. So you have to realize that there's a backlog of, of having to make adults and having to make elders so we can have young people that transition from young childhood into adulthood. So the long-term process, why I love what's happening here, to bring it back to this place, Wolf Connection, when we originally talked about, like I was telling you guys earlier, when Teo was looking at buying this property, one of the things that we want to do is to create uh, some sort of a center where all these things could take place, reconnect with nature, reconnect with ourselves as individuals, and bring some sort of well-being and healing to the culture on a lot of different aspects. If you don't have a way of looking at this in a large, broad picture, you're never going to look at the, uh, address it from the proper level. For me, uh, in particular, I'm going to go in a number of ways here talking to you guys because there's a lot of information to cover. That's interesting, <laughs> right? But if you don't have the whole picture in mind, right, yeah. then, mm-hmm. you don't, then you don't address it at the proper level. And we, we, a lot of us carry a lot of wounding, not only from the culture, but from the family lineages that we are born into. And this is what we have to heal if we have a, an opportunity to really create the necessary change in order to move forward from, from this, this incredible hamster wheel that we're stuck in. Yeah. So one of my teachers said to me, the difference between feeling and emotion, he was trying to uh, teach me some psychological principles. He said, the difference between feeling and emotion is this. He said, feeling is biological and emotion is biology and biography, right? So when you start examining all the layers of biography that you live in, then you have to realize what happened to you from the time that you were conceived even before you were conceived, all through your years, all through the decades, right? And what entanglements are there that need to be dealt with? So for me, you're looking, um, I'm looking at when I work with individuals in particular, I look at how they are at a core level. Core level for me is not just um, working basically your muscles with some yoga and keto diet or something like that, but it's like (laughs) looking at all the different layers of the individual, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, and also in connection to the environment. 
I've been working with people, like I said, uh, at risk youth for 25 plus years, uh, working with veterans in and out of the military for uh, about 12 years or so, and also with people in rehab after for about 10 or 11 years now. And from all these different segments of the population, I can see that uh, when you strip away all the particulars, you know, uh, age, gender, right, uh, racial and, and social and ethnic origin, the wounding that the individuals carry is the same. I could take somebody from rural Minnesota, rural Appalachia, rural Watts, rural East LA, and the <laughs> wounding process is exactly identical. It doesn't matter. So you realize, I've learned this, that we are human beings first in the larger community of beings. Men and women second, and then come all the social ethnic groups. So if we have a shot at, at, at trying to really create healing for us, we have to go all the way back to the beginning, re, re-sanctify ourselves, reclaim ourselves as, as human beings, right? And the larger community of beings. And that way, all the other things settles down. Yeah. Then it doesn't matter what your gender preference is, you know, what, what pronoun you used to call yourself, all that, it, it, because you will be a wholly integrated individual mm-hmm. on all layers in relationship to the world around you. Yeah. I you mean, look- yeah. No, because I, I love what you said in this, this journey that you've been on, which you so eloquently, you know, stated here just in the beginning. Do you find it fascinating that you've been healing your entire life? Because you started off, like you said, with your parents you know, in the, in the doctor's office behind, behind the house and did your residency and then you come out and you're healing through music and now you're healing in this way. Do you feel that you were pre, you know, almost like destined to do this? This was your calling, obviously, right? I mean. Mm, the answer is yes. I mean. <laughs> the short answer is yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. But ever since I was a kid, I knew I was born to help people in some form. You know, I just didn't know what, what, what uh, format it was going to take, you know. So now that I realize that for me, it's a huge piece trying to understand because we have, if, we have, if we are going to get a shot at fe- healing it, we have to heal the culture that we're in mm-hmm. right now. Right. What people don't realize is that the ones that are in trouble, the earth is not in trouble. We <laughs> are the ones that are in trouble. It's the humans. It's true. There's been massive destructions and, and, and mass extinctions for, for eons on this planet. You know, The end of each geologic, major geological era is marked by a mass extinction in some form or another, you know? Mm-hmm. And I know we're getting close to one right now in some form or another, but yeah. the question is, will we be able to survive? And I and I see uh, as it's really important uh, to, it is important for us to not give up and to try to figure out how to solve this, how to, how to belong, how to be in relationship to the world that we live in. And this is the beauty of these teachings that was given to me of the, uh, the teachings that were given to me by the elders, because this is what they wanted to do. They wanted to under, us to understand fully what it is to be in relationship, not only to each other as individuals, but to each other in the largest sense of what the community is, of all the other beings that occupy this space, all the elemental beings, all the, uh, all the plants, all the animals, because we're one big family. Yeah, I mean, when you do these, because when you do these, sweat lodges and these vision quests is that how you bring those teachings in is that is that a, a more what's the word i'm trying to use steven so like you know you're really sort of paring it down into this into this comprehensive yeah experience where it all comes together yeah so like um, when you like when you do a sweat lodge so go through a sweat lodge and how like those teachings work and how we're how because i i've never done one i know steven you were with mm-hmm. Miguel on one of the last couple that we did on the property. Yeah. So go through a sweat lodge when you have a group of individuals and what the, I don't even say the goals, but what's really going into making that sweat lodge work. Yeah, and I remember you using the word, I think you used the word molting. Yeah. Um, before <laughs> yeah, the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. for some reason that I got that. Like, um, I guess because I spend a lot of time thinking and talking about animals and their their annual processes and that's just a, a deep interest to me. So when you said malting, I was like, wow, that's a really profound word that I've never said in the same word as human being. Um, and it totally made sense to me. And then afterwards, I, I got it. And I basically never forgot that experience, really. Yeah. So I can, I can go on for a while with this. You know, what's really critical, you realize, and I've been, uh, my teachers always used to go, I'm going to sound like a broken record because they keep repeating the same thing <laughs> over and over again. But this is the one thing through that kind of repetition is you understand something gets transmitted to us and it gets reinforced. Mm. You know, a friend of mine used to say, repetition is not redundant, repetition is amplification. But to start with the molting, right? Mm. We are the only species that I know of, I'm aware of, that doesn't molt. 
that we don't lose fur, we don't lose feathers, we don't lose scales, we don't lose uh, leaves and branches, you know. So we need a ritual process that duplicates that in a very intense way. And the sweat lodge is one of the ways in which you do it. There's many different ways of native, native there's many, uh, when you study native ceremonies from all over the world, they have a ritual process that they do on a constant basis in order to maintain that process alive. And if you can imagine, if we don't do that, the backup, you know what it is not to move your bowels for a certain amount of time. It's, it's painful, right? Mm. So if we don't do it emotionally and spiritually, the backup is the, it's massive. And also you have to look at what the backup is in the culture, right? If, the, if these things have not been addressed for eons, as far as I'm concerned, the backup is huge. The Lodge works on a lot of different levels. I'll give you the, the nuts and bolts. And I've learned this mm. uh, after 40 years of running Lodges. I've had to... Um, Condense, kind of pare it down. Yeah. Kind of pare, not pare it down, but make it really. In some people, like for instance, I'm working with people in rehab. I've been working. I run Swiss for a rehab facility here in LA. Once a week. When I started out with them ten years ago, they wanted one one a month. Then they wanted two a month. Then they wanted one once a week. So for the last three or four years, it's been one a week or more hmm. that I've run a sweat hmm. for these people. And what's important is to realize how significant it is. So I had to really figure out if I only if I'm only going if I'm only going to see a person one or two times, three at the most, I have to infuse them with a, as much as possible with an experience that will stay with them and really inform them. So I have to create language. And this language has come from 40 years of running ceremonies, you know, running. And I use the word ceremony because this is, this is the word that my teachers used, right? Whenever they would hear, they would, in, they would be really uh, emphatic and they, you are there not as a spectator, but as a participant. And a lot of times when people come around native peoples, they want to mine them. Like you have all the anthropologists that want to get their books published. So when some, when they would see university people, academics coming around asking questions and they would use the word ritual, they always knew they call them miners. They're always mining. They don't want to really participate in the ceremonies, but just trying to get information to write a book. So they always use ceremony. So that's why, not this, why I use ceremony. And I love it because I think every time I use the word, that's, I think about them and I say a uh, level of gratitude for them, for them being in my life. But, in the ceremonies, right, they reenact, in, in the sweat lodge in particular, you reenact two different points of origin, right? You go back and you recreate the making of the universe, how the universe started. And from the nothingness, all the elements begin to appear, and you study creation stories. So what I like to say before I run a lodge is creation stories from all over the world start the same way. In the beginning, there was nothing. So when we go in there, you, you reenact, you go all the way back to the primordial darkness, the holy black is what we used to call it. We sit in the lodge in the dark, and that's what it represents. And in that darkness, the potential for manifestation is there. Imagine a universe with no galaxies, right? No butterflies, no flowers, no lattes, no cappuccinos, no vegan <laughs> cuisine, right? All the beautiful things that you like, no spas, no jacuzzis, no Mount Everest, but the potential for that being there. So when you return to that darkness, that's where you go back to that potential of manifestation. So you recreate the, the making of the universe. Fire appears, water appears, and then they make matter, and then which makes life, right? Also, in the lodge, you, you take a fire, stones, volcanic stones, put them in the fire and heat them up for a number of hours. And then you bring them in. And when they come in, they, they're like these beautiful red glowing stones, right? And they represent sperm, right? So you're reenacting conception. The lodge becomes the egg, Sperm going into, <laughs> into egg re, du, uh, duplicates conception, right? Inside, gestation, emergence, birth. So you go to two different points of origin. And what, and what I like to say, we're going to go back to the beginning of the universe and the beginning of you. And in case something happened, and I'm not saying that it did, but in case something happened that made you forget how holy those moments were, we're going to go back there and create an experience that's going to sit now in your body. You will become informed by that now. Atoms, molecules, cells, tissue, marrow, organs will remember this experience now so that when you're sitting, when you get rattled by modern times and as soon as you get out of this place, right, get out of the other freeways, somebody's going to cut you off, somebody's going to steal your parking spot, somebody's going to yell at you for going too fast or too slow. That happened mm -hmm. to me on the way here. <laughs> I got cut off by three different cars. <laughs> and I'm going, but I'm not going to buy into that, you know. So, But now mm -hmm. you have a memory event in your life that actually allows you to regulate your nervous system, right? One of the things uh, in all my, I've read a lot of books over the years, and there's a, a friend of mine, one of my teachers gave me a book, 
in, in this book, there's an anonymous quote at the beginning that says, God will forgive you for your sins, but your nervous system won't. Right? So here we are in this particular ceremony, right? The lodge allowing you to regulate your nervous system, right? In a way so that you can actually get coherent. So these are, these are some of the benefits of why these ceremonies are important, why the rituals are important. If we don't have rituals like that, that contextualize ourselves and put us in relationship in order to be able to claim our, a coherent relationship of ourselves, right? Then we, we're always operating at the wrong level. This guy that I heard speak years ago in Boulder, he said this, we're these luminous beings, right? And stuff happens to us. An event here, an event there, we get covered with layers of crap. One more event, three more events, three or four more layers of crap. Then we go read a book. And then we put a layer of paint on, paint on these layers of crap. We go to a workshop or two, two more layers of paint. So then we walk around congratulating ourselves on a nice paint job, right? <laughs> but you have all But these underneath la- it, yeah, there's the buildup. There's the buildup. So, and, but meantime, so there's an incoherence, right? In audio terminology, we have phase coherence, right? So mm-hmm. if you're not phase coherent with your core, right? Then you're going. There's going to be a discrepancy. The truth yeah. of who you are as an individual will not be there. And when something doesn't sound good, adding to it doesn't work. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, take away. Can. It works. Honestly, it works. It's it's kind of a metaphor. I mean, all crea- creativity is sort of a metaphor for it. Like even in video, for example, like I rarely add color to something. I usually remove color to make it look more natural or remove frequency instead of adding frequency to to EQs or compressions. Like, um, yeah. It's funny too when you say that, yeah, because when I do video too and I'm doing video editing and it, it's almost you want to affect things too much. Yeah. You know, put, a, put an effect on it, make it look different. And it's, to me, I agree with you. To it's, cover up bad to quality. To cover up usually, bad quality. Yeah. But yeah, but in some ways that bad quality can <laughs> probably give you a better perspective right. yeah. than putting all the, the glossy things over it mm. to make it I like know, analogies. Better, I like right? analogies yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you realize this, this is a, a, a journey of discovery, right? Yeah. yeah. And all these things, like if we're talking about the layers, right? All these layers, mm-hmm. they're, they're protective layers that mm-hmm. we have put on to protect ourselves. But at some point in time, they will become liabilities in our life, right? So we have to figure out how we're going to get rid of these layers so that we can actually get and reclaim and re-sanctify our core. And that's the journey. And to me, I've, I've, uh, you see, when you read statistics, right, to use that word uh, in, a, in a very coherent sense or in a very specific way, uh, a large number of us have some sort of a compromising situation from the time that we're conceived. <laughs> and so you're from the get-go, and many, many of us were not conceived under ideal circumstances, you know. I know this for a fact. <laughs> <laughs> Three of my daughters were not planned, and I can say that specifically. So I was like, "Oh my God, what are we gonna do?" <laughs> All right. So we have to. Do- Fortunately, I was able to provide for them in a good. A lot of kids that I work with had not been raised in the- under those kind of circumstances. You know, you look like yeah. you have a question. No, I was just thinking. Um, yeah. No, I just <laughs> to to go about my <laughs> about your uh- <laughs> yeah. I mean, I probably wasn't. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I was playing. My mother always jokes about it, but she always says I wanted. I was. We were going to do it, but it wasn't going to be at that. At that <laughs> it seems like it's never at the moment. I know. It's when always a they, big oops, you know, right? There's always an oops. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, when you have when you have these when you have these individuals in these sweat lodges, then when they're going back to those, do what do a lot of do a lot of those reactions or those feelings come up? organically right away or is it a, is it a slow burn almost in the process what do you notice some of the time that happens I've or is it different for everyone it's different for everybody and it's sometimes it's not expected because what happens most people have not learned have not been held in a place where they're totally safe you know and as soon as they get into a place where they know that they're safe, it's amazing how relaxed they how they don't realize how fast they've been running and how tired they are from running Mm-hmm. And I've seen this over and over again to realize that, that one of the, the way we were taught how to run lodges, this group of us, and my, including myself included, we w- need to make that space holy and we need to make that space safe. And that's what we work really hard to provide. And when people feel safe and protected in that way, you realize, oh, I can actually be myself. And what I've learned when um, the, the, the teachings of the wheel, right, the medicine wheel mm-hmm. teachings, which are included in the lodge, is everything has a place there. Nothing is excluded. Everything that exists in the universe is represented there. And when you say that with a certain type of emphasis and heart, 
people feel it and they when they and I've had so many people tell me after after so many years of running I've I was trying to figure out how many lodges I've been in, in during my life, and I know it's over 5,000, you know. Wow. <laughs> so 40 years of running, you know, uh, a lodge at least once a week, sometimes more than one uh, a week, but sometimes more than one a day. Right? It's like, you know, at least 5,000 lodges. You, you, you wow. begin to see patterns, right? <laughs> yeah. And one of them is when I say, here you belong, here you have a place, and people actually feel it. And I, I had one guy in particular, he was at the rehab facility last year, he said to me, I never knew... I, I could belong, that I had a place to belong to. And, it, and I've heard that many, many times over the years. And, you, and they don't have to say it, but I can see how the body, their bodies relax when I say you belong here. Wow. And here you have, there's a place for you. When you use that language too, is that is that a way for you? Because to me, just by you saying that, that's such a challenging way to bring in all, because you're bringing in all these individuals from all different walks of life, religions and, and cultures and mm-hmm. to is it, to me, it sounds so simple and I know it's not, it can't be that simple, but is that the type of verbiage that you've been going through these past 40 years to try and be so inclusive? Exactly, yeah. And I mean, I'll tell you an interesting story that makes me think of it. When we started out, uh, the medicine people had a young, a younger teacher that was coming around uh, showing us things. And at one point he got really belligerent with us and he started threatening us, you know. So I called up my grandfather. We adopted each other. We got adopted. This is how we were taught. We became adopted. I became a, 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 an adopted Cree, Muscogee Creek, right, and also Lakota. So I called up my Muscogee Creek uh, grandfather and I said, what do we do? And there was about 10 of us at that time uh, that were serious about what we were doing. And he said, come over and I'll fix it for you. So we flew to New Mexico. You know, we got into a lodge. And all the stones come in, we're sitting in the lodge, and the first thing he said, he didn't say nothing, he was completely silent. He goes, whatever's going to come after you is going to have to go through me first. Nobody had ever said that to me in my life. I was 27 years old when I heard that. The moment I I, I heard that, I was going, wow. And you, if you can imagine a, a, a one-year-old baby knowing that it will be protected at all costs, no matter what happens, by its parents or grandparents. It's a humongous, you don't have to carry the weight of the world. Many people, I've seen this because I've heard stories, uh, what they do is their parents put them in front, they use them in shields, you know, <laughs> to go through the world, which is that the most terrible, talk about abuse, That's, and that happens a lot. I've seen it. I've, I've heard stories. I've, I've been listening to people's stories for well over 50 years, and I can tell you with consistency that there's a lot of things, and that's one of them. Children are not protected unconditionally under many circumstances, you know. When you when you look at that, when you say that, when children are protected unconditionally, and you want them to be protected at all costs, what's the line that maybe you see when you have people that come in that, is there a level of overprotection Especially, let's look at like today's society where kids are shielded or protected or the road is sort of paved away for them so there are no obstacles. What do you see when you do sweat lodges or vision quests that allows them to to go through, I guess, some sort of adversity? Is that part of the process? Well, or there's the a balance that happens there. Well, yeah, sorry for interrupting. No, no, please. The, uh, the, there's a big difference between protection and control. So that's a huge. Yeah, no, that's no, but yeah, I want to get that that clarification because you cannot control the individuals, right? But Mm. you can protect them so that they can figure out what it is that they do. Mm. And as a parent, what I learned from being a parent is I knew that my my kids were all born with a particular purpose. My job as a parent was not to get in the way of that purpose, you know, or or to vicariously live my life through them, which which is what a lot of parents do. And so those are two, and as long as that gets sorted out in some form or another, then you will always be protecting the child. But my job as a father, right, is to provide food, nourishment, roof, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes because I do that, I won't be able to teach everything that I know to my kids. You know, I, I know that, you know, I'm, I'm always telling them, you know, pick up your clothes, wash your face, do brush your teeth, do, do your homework, you know. So after a while, <laughs> when you start talking about universal concepts like, you know, conception and everything, all they hear is whack, 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 <laughs> whack, whack, whack. So they have to hear the same thing from, I've learned this from mentoring too. I go, oh, yeah, that's reflective, you know. 
my wife and my son, they go, oh, you're telling that story again. Oh, they roll their <laughs> eyes. <laughs> they, but like you said, repetition. <laughs> repetition. Repetition, <laughs> but, it's, yeah. but it's something to make a and point. And it's true. Be, I, I see children, they're an easy target for parents with good intentions to enact the things they didn't get or they that they need through their children. I heard this and I've seen it said many times. Oh, you're the man of the house now when you say that to a, I mean, to a young boy in particular who's not prepared to, to observe, to replace a father in that form and other. But you realize that many of us were not taught, our parents were not taught how to parent properly. And, yeah. so, and who knows for how many It's compounding over. It's compounded over, yeah. So where is, where? It's yeah. like you said, it's the layers. It's the layers exactly. and then the paint yeah. on yeah. top and of I it. And I think yeah. that's related to the concept you were talking about in the first place, which is our sort of, I don't want to say lack, our, our missing elders, it, it, it's just compounded generation after generation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And elders have been coming up a lot here, actually, with um, Kira. Yeah. Um, elders in a wolf pack. Um, and I mentioned a podcast I'd listened to about elders in um, early humans um, and just how important they were. And I actually had a question about that because you mentioned that before, is um, what do you think the reason for that... Um, changing in elder behavior. I mean, it almost is like, no matter how old we get in this society, we still are obsessed with individualism to the point where like, it, getting old is about relaxing and just sort of removing Going yourself side, from, yeah. like removing yourself from having to teach anything or having any responsibilities. It just feels that way. Um, and I was, I had a, a men's group um, with Teo. I think you were there. I right? was there, yeah. Yeah, and he was talking about the archetypes and I started reading a lot about the sage, and that was the one that I was drawn to the most. And um, just light bulb went off that I never see this person that's being described here in society. Like rarely ever do I see this person represented in family structures anymore. Just like a, an, a wise elder who feels like it's their responsibility to pass wisdom down, mm. you know? Yeah. I mean, I didn't have... Uh direct relationship with somebody like that when I was a kid. Yeah, I mean. Mm. So I realized that I learned a lot of the fathering that I learned. I learned it by remembering what I didn't have and wanting to provide that. When I was uh, 12 years old, I got put in a boarding school. And uh, this is in Guatemala. And uh, the first few days that we were there, all the kids were bragging about, they all had these amazing stories about their dads. Their mm. dad, they would, they would take them hunting, they would take them fishing, flying on private planes and everything. It's like, and, and I had no stories. My dad at all whatsoever, zero. Mm. And I was really like, I really felt like I couldn't tell of a story of my father because I, I don't even remember my father holding me, you know. And so I realized I made a, I made a choice then that I was going to steal fathering. I was going to learn something from every man that I met without telling him. <laughs> exactly. So, but knowing that, you know, realizing that, then uh, one of the things that, I, and all the men, many of the men in my family died at a very young age. My father died when he was 33. My dear uncles died in their 40s, you know. And so I had, so there was, there's only one man left now. He's 101 years old. One of my uncles, he's still around. <laughs> but wow. he's really hard to talk to because he's, like he's like a 15-year-old. You know, He's not like an elder, a true elder, but he still, it gives me a place to go to. But uh, over the years of mentoring, one of the things that I've done is I've sit, uh, I stood in front of a, one of the groups that we brought up here with uh, Chris Hendrickson from Street Poets mm-hmm. and Tony uh, Murray from Youth Mentoring Connection and the mm-hmm. Rhythm Marts Alliance. We've been doing these retreats. So what I told, I was asked to give a blessing <clears throat> to um, a group of young young men about three years ago. And, I, and when I, st- I didn't know exactly what I was going to say, but I said this. When I was your age, I said, I didn't have a wrinkled up old gray hair talking to you the way I'm talking, <laughs> talking to me the way I'm talking to you now. So I said, I want you to be, I want you to grow up to be wrinkled up old gray hairs. And remembering this eat, this night, and then you blessing a bunch of 15-year-olds Currently sure. headed 15 year olds the wow. way you are now. And they all go like, wow. <laughs> and one of the kids, it was, it was touched, you know, because he's he had a long, I, I know I happen to know a lot of their personal stories, but as we went through the, the retreat and did the, the, the final ritual, we, we had a beautiful ritual going into a lake and going and submerging in the water. And then we spent about uh, several hours in front of a fireplace inside the lodge when we were finished and we had a, a, a prayer. And one of the kids got up and said, I want to be a grandfather. 
and I want to hold my grandson in my arms, blessing him, you know. And that was, that's, if, if we're going to get hope, you know, <laughs> this is long. how we're going to do it. And this is the, this is how we have to do it. But it's all intergenerational, you know, and you cannot do one thing without the other. The role, inter, the inter, interdependency is one of the things that you learn when you start participating in native ceremonies, you know, how interdependent we are with each other. Reciprocity, reciprocity with the earth, you know. And this is what we, we humans are so far behind. Yeah. Our debt to the, to the universe or to the world, for that matter, is huge because we don't reciprocate. To the, we take from the earth, but we don't reciprocate. Case in point, when I was sun dancing, my first year of sun dancing, uh, the task was to go talk to the plants and get permission. Our, our task was to cut sage, but we, would not, we could not cut the sage until we had told the, the, the plants what we were doing. You know, so we found this patch. This is in the outside of Denver, in the foothills overlooking the plains. And so we found this beautiful patch of sage. And I had already read the Secret Life of Plants and several other plant books, so I kind of knew what the deal was. That's a good one. Mm. You know, and so I'm there talking, and all of a sudden, it's not words, but I could see the plants begin to shimmer. And what I understood, translating what the energy was from the shimmering was me. I want to go. Take me. I want to participate. I had told the plants what we were going to do. We were going to Sundance. We were going to, you know, pray so that the whole, we could figure out how to live in this world. There's a whole way in which we address the, the, uh, the other beings uh, when, and when you learn how to talk to plants. And you realize it's all participatory, you know. And knowing, and one of the things that I've learned, especially in building sweat lodges, when we go cut willow or whatever tree we're going to use, sapling we're going to use, I say to them, my relatives, I have come today to take your life, knowing that someday I will be food for some of you. Not necessarily you, but I will, I will put my body in this earth. I willingly, I want to be food for some of you, so some, for some of your relatives. And right away, the reciprocity is huge. I was at a funeral about 10 years ago. My mother's younger sister died, right? She's here in East LA, somewhere in West Covina. And I see her embalmed body, right, inside of a metal casket being lowered into a concrete enclosure. And everything in me was going, ah. we should be, the roots of the grass should be able to eat off of her body. You yeah. know? And that's, that's the way we look at it. We should be able to be reciprocal. And the only thing that we have that's truly ours is our body. Yeah. So, you know. Man. It's mind-blowing that we still do that to me, to be honest. Oh, Put people dude. in the ground in boxes that don't decompose. I mean, I just, I'm confused about that one or how it got, how it got to that point. It's, it's arrogant, the most natural right? part of the, the process. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My I mean, uncle I, just said he wants to be put into a vinyl record. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so hilarious, that's, dude. I mean, there's a, there's a service. Right, yeah, there's yeah, right. a service. At least it's, it's, it's pre, it's, wow. <laughs> there's a service. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I want to go back to what you said before, which I, I, I love with the when you were talking about the elders and tying the medicine wheel with this because Stephen and I have done multiple programs up here. And it's fascinating to me the amount of young men and women who actually identify with the winter and the elder side. And there's always, there's always that, oh, it's the immediate sometimes words that are used are, you know, old, death. You know, th those are the words when we ask, you know, what is, you know, the winter or the, you know, this, this season remind you of? And that's sometimes the words they go to, but it's amazing how much wisdom by the end of the eight week program that we have, or the, yeah, the eight week program that we have, that they t start to identify with, like you said, I want to have a family. I want to be a grandfather. I want to be, um, I want to teach. I want to coach. And how many of them want to take on that teaching role as opposed to, you know, I want to be, you know, not young forever, but I want to, it, it seems like it's more and more, natural that these young people want to take on that role and be stewards and educate and teach. Have you seen that with- Oh yeah, totally. Because they want to be in relationship to the world around them. They don't want to be disconnected from the world, you know? And it's a way of participating, you know? And I look at it as, as what's really important is I look at myself now as a, and I don't think of my, I'm 67 years old, you know? But I, what I'm, I'm, I'm showing these kids that it is possible to be 16, 67 year old and, and be relevant to what's going on, you know? When I was in my, I, I never thought that I would live to, to see 33 years old. 
for years I was convinced I was going to die by the time I was going to be 33. Uh, we did a retreat in 1995 where we had 50 kids from different cities, Chicago, all the Bay Area cities, right, L.A. and New Orleans, 50 kids there. Were, most of them had been in and out of gangs or were still in, can, in gangs currently, right? I learned a lot from that retreat. But one of the things, I had talked to every single man, every single young man, I went and found out what their story was, you know. And the one thing that they all had in common, all of them had never had a reasonable conversation with a man over 25 years old ever in their life. I was astounded. I was, what? I was thinking, could it be this simple? Yes, it's simple, but it's not easy. Mm-hmm. Not not by a long shot, you know. And so you realize that is fraught with um, with uh, a lot of um, what what's the story there? In working with uh, with youth at risk, right? Kids in and out of gangs. And then we did a retreat about ten years ago where we got ki- uh, kids that uh, kids that were in and out of gangs, in and out of prison, together with veterans, right? <laughs> and with anti-war protesters. We it was just and we were not planning it, but that's how it happened. It was really beautiful. And then I realized you take out all the particulars, race, social order, and the stories are like I was saying earlier, the parallels are identical. So the wounding process is much deeper, and it, it all starts in the home, right? It, gets, it all starts in the home. So we have to re-sanctify the home and how to provide a, 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 a viable relationship with mother energy, archetypal energy, father archetypal energy. So one of my tasks is to reinvigorate the archetypal energy in the world and in this country in particular. So when people say mother, they know they think of the Holy Mother in particular and the Holy Father, the universal father, the universal mother. One of the things that I've learned from sun dancing is how to connect to those energies on a universal level. And to me, like an archetype is not just a symbol, it's not just an idea, it's not an academic position, but it's a living, breathing energy that's it's like here, you know. One of the things that Teo does here, immediately they go make a fire, you know. You can't get any more primordial than that by making fire. A friend of mine, he was from South Central LA, and I met him in early 19, 1990 or 1989. And he had studied with uh, an esoteric uh, school in Watts named the Aquarian Study Center or something like that. And we were having a conversation about fire one time, and he was talking about Lemurian fire, Atlantean fire, right? Druid fire, Dogon fire, and all these kinds of fires. And I said, did you guys ever go out and build a fire? And he said, no, I just about fell out of my chair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you, go, so you, have, to, you have to make a fire, you know? True. So, yeah. And that's where we come in. With being in a relationship to the land and to the creatures around, we have to get our hands in the dirt and the mud and figure out how to connect. So that's, the, you know. Man, so. it's true. Anytime I'm on a remote backpacking trip where fires are not allowed above 10,000 feet or something, it's always the first thing I think about in the morning and the last thing I think about at night. I'm like, man, if we just have a fire, this would be a very different experience. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's the greatest thing. I, I just sit, th- you can just sit there and stare at a fire. There's something so visceral about it. You stare at it. It's just crackling and you just, everything feels better. Like it's been solved. Man. I'm, I mean, yeah. No, when you, so when you, the thing, uh, what was my question? So when you have these, when you have these different, like you said, you have the veterans and you have the anti-war protesters and all these other different things. How how do you see, because you said the wounding process is so deep. Is the healing process just as, I don't even want to say rewarding, but it, do you see it come through as you're teaching and as, as these vision quests are going on or as these sweat lodges are going on that the healing happens just as viscerally? Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Oh, totally. I mean, and sometimes it takes a while. In learning, you have to learn the languages, right, uh, for each social uh, order. Mm. <laughs> but I've learned this in peeling back the layers. It's like going, making your way back to the core of the individual, right? Mm. It's like going through a minefield to disarm an IED, right, if you know what that is. Yes. And, mm-hmm. and so this is, you're looking at defense mechanisms that have, put in, that have been put in place by the soul in order to protect the body. And when you're renegotiating those are those terms, what allowed you to survive, right? And your soul had to work really hard to protect your body. You had to do whatever you had to do in order to survive 
whatever it was, you know, I'm not going to say anything. Mm -hmm. I'll leave that up to those that are listening. And it restarts every morning. Right. Yeah. But yeah. It starts every day. Right. 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 You go, oh my God. Exactly. And, but that's, that's what you know. And that's yeah. what allow. And are you willing to give that up? Yeah. What protected you in as warped as, as strange as that is. I mean, I have a story, you know, uh, years ago, a friend of mine gave me a tape. And it was given to him by a bunch of guys that were in a prison in upstate New York, right? He said this, uh, when the society fails to provide proper rights of initiation for an individual, an individual will create his or her own, no matter how warped they may be, right? So if, the, if the, our institutions don't provide the correct rituals, right, then we don't have them, then we'll create our own. The soul needs something. So people, when they're in their teens, they need initiation, right? So what do you do? You go out, rob a liquor store, get into a fight, crash a motorcycle, crash and uh, get into a huge fight, right? Get into a gang, go join the military. But those are pseudo rituals. They're partial rituals and they're not proper initiation. So even though you go through something that's that intense as an initiation, right? You still have to go uncouple from that because that's a warped Right. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying they're looking for something to challenge and test themselves? Tempering. Yeah, Tempering. I see. It's, basically, have, it's in yeah. place of a vision quest, basically, exactly. right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tempering rituals. We have substituted wounding for cooking, for tempering, right? And so we make wounding the normalized, you know, having to go through the military, having to go through a gang, having to go through a car accident, an overdose, a fight, and that's okay, mm -hmm. you're initiated mm -hmm. now. No, you're not. <laughs> that's a substance. That's what you call a toxic mimic. You know, in, when you, in nature, a toxic mimic, for instance, like um, the difference between a monarch butterfly and, uh, and, a, and a vice royal or something like that, the monarchs are toxic, mm -hmm. right? Because they eat milkweed and so the birds won't, won't eat them. But there's a species of butterflies that it has the exact same colors as the monarchs, but they're not toxic at all, the viceroys. So the birds won't eat them either. So that's a toxic mimic in order to create, right, safety. Mm -hmm. So the birds leave them alone. However, in human terms, right, a toxic mimic is something that looks like initiation, but it's not initiation. So, but because it's not initiation, it's toxic to the human being. So you stay, you stay malinformed. You know, it creates bad habit patterns, you know. Wow. So that's really important. To, you have to be able to discern the difference. Yeah. I mean, so how, when, mm -hmm. when you do all these things and you have all these teachings, how did you bring that to Wolf Connection then? Because, you, I mean, you've been with us for such a long time. You're a board member also. I mean, what's... How did you connect the dots? And, yeah, and, and how does it tie energetically yeah. into wolves as a... Because yeah. this is a laboratory, right? This is a, yeah. like a living, breathing laboratory. So we can complement, like I, I've had, uh, when we do the retreats, we complement the sweat lodge and the time in the land as part of the, of the connection with the, with, the, with the animals, you know, with the mm -hmm. wolves. So we can do a lodge and then you have a coming, a coming together. When you do a lodge, for instance, it's a way for all these different things that are parallel strands to get opened up and get, and get connected intrinsically. It's like it seals the deal. So the experience gets, gets confirmed on energetic levels. And for us and for me in particular, it's a way of always looking at it. I've run vision quests here for, 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 for individuals, you know, that we did one uh, last summer was the last one. Uh, many mm -hmm. of the guys that I work, that I've been in community with, all go to South Dakota, the Sundance. They couldn't go to South Dakota, the Sundance last summer. So we did a one-day <laughs> vision quest here, day on the land, to bring all those prayers together. And every couple of hours, and when, there, when something significant was happening for somebody, the wolves would always be howl in concert. Yeah, they do it every and time. And it's happened, every time. I've seen it happen here so many times over yeah. the years, you know. Yeah. But the whole thing is to be, is to figure out how to be in concert or how to be in relationship with the world around you completely with everything, you know. Mm. The butterflies, the hummingbirds, you know, the, 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 the plants, the quail, like you were saying, the plants, the, the willows, yeah, yeah. everything, you know. So there's, there's, I know there's bear up here. I know there's mountain lions up here too. All Definitely now. Yeah. yeah. They've been pushed here by the fires. It's been great to see footprints. Uh, yeah. Bear prints lately. And that's just, and so you're, so you're, you're pulling everything. That's yeah. the goal is just to pull it all together in, in unison. Is there, is there anything specific about the wolf itself that you think as a, as a teacher, because we learn so much on a daily basis just by, feeding and scooping and just being around them. Is there something that you draw from them as well when you're doing your teaching, your Native American teachings? Was there anything that the wolf brought to you? Uh, for me in particular, it means that there's a part of me that it's always holy 
right? And it's always, um, I don't want to use the word fierce, but it's like it, it, it cannot be tamed, you know, mm-hmm. it will not be commodified. Mm-hmm. It cannot be paved over, you know, there's like, there's a part of me that's unconditionally uh, connected to the universe and will not, will not succumb to being, you know, commodified or yeah. <laughs> gentrified. Mm. That to me is that's, that's that's what the wolves represent, a certain sense of being uh, uh, in relationship and in love with the wild, you know, or to, to, with the raw, primor- it's primordial. It's a very primordial energy. Mm. Yep. So. Yeah, I mean, they're... I mean, it's just so fascinating. I mean, that's interesting because I didn't know that they how did they they howled after each big event or each big oh. you know spiritual event or something. You know, what I mean that 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 to me is just they so... do it with the program. I mean, they do it. Oh the no, programs. they do with the programs, but it's. I mean, I remember when Ozzy was passing away. I was meditating next to him while he you know in his last hour maybe. I remember in my mind like thinking, what well, would be a great way to send him off right now? And I thought. Oh, maybe a pack howl would be a good a good way, and maybe they will. As soon as I've had the thought, it was like an eruption of howling. And it's and it's interesting too, right, Miguel? Because when you guys are here and you're doing you're doing a, a sweat lodge, you're hundreds, if not thousands, of feet away, and there's still that connection. There's still that bond and that energetic, you know, in sync, basically yeah. sync up that happens, right? Well, it's like a us thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And it, it, to me, it's, it holds community. It makes communities happen. The community is not just about the people, but it's about all of the beings, right? And to me, that's a reminder because it's, it's very visceral how it happens with the wolves, and it reminds us right away that there's a that this world is much, much larger than what we acknowledge or what we perceive. And they break down the barriers really. I can remember the first time I came up to see Teo, and we brought, brought me to one, and it's like I'm going. It, the, I can't remember the name of the wolf at the time, but the way he looked at me and the way I looked at him, like, okay, I see that the, the what what's in the wolf was saying to me. I see me and you, and I'm mm. glad you, you haven't forgotten how to acknowledge that, you know. And that's the point. There's a part of us that's connected to the vastness of this universe, right? And it's an us in them, and it's not it's not uh, me and them. It's not me and the world, and it's not a, it's not about me. But it's a, there's an usness, you know. I don't know. I don't know how. Bad no, yeah, no, it, that's know? no, that's right. I, I mean, because we we say that all the time because it's whenever we whenever I give a tour, whenever we talk with the kids, is we're meeting this animal on an even plane. Right. We we are an even partner in this entire world universe wherever we are, and from everything you've described here today, it's, that's what you do with the individuals on the, in these sweat lodges and on these, you know, in these teachings is that we are all on the same level. There's no, like you said, you break down those art, you know, those stereotypes and those cultural barriers. And it's once you peel, like you said, the molting or the peeling of the layers, we are the same individuals just in different bodies. Exactly. Yeah. 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 There is no us in them. It's yeah. all us. And then we have to figure out how to make the us, you know, and everybody shows up on, 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 a, on a level playing field, you know, and that's, and that's how you have to make it, you know. Yeah. And it's web-based. That's the other thing, though. It's not a vertical hierarchy, but it's, it's a web-based hierarchy. So it's relational. It's all in relationship to each other, you know. Right. So you yeah. sort of build that from the center, yeah. right? You're building right. that from yeah. one, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's such a great way to say it. Yeah. Like our, our intelligence is, is different as a species, but our needs and desires, I find now, are this, I, I recognize are the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I, I want to just touch on a couple, a couple other things before, before we let you go. The long-term goal for you and your teachings, did you, I, I know you guys, op- did you open up uh, a teaching center or a school? Wasn't there something that you guys did? We're working on You're it. You're working on that, okay. Everything is being worked on right now. Everything is totally developmental, you know, so. Okay. Because there's a place where we need to have all these activities. The long-term goal was to have that happen here. So, yeah. T- so that's still a long-term goal. We're still getting there, yeah. Yeah, so it takes a while, you know, sometimes yeah. you want to see it done in nine months, you know, but it's going <laughs> to happen in 36 months, okay? So it just, you yeah. know, instead of one or two years, it's taking 10 years, yeah. but we've learned these things, you <laughs> know. Instead of one or two years, it's taking five times. You, you go slow, you know, because yeah. because of the, it, it's yeah. like peeling back the layers carefully, you know, it's like mm-hmm. repotting a plant, everything's like, oh. Yeah, and trying to force it doesn't necessarily make it right. ever any better. No, 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 no. <laughs> Generally end up, going faster to the wrong place. And it's all that sacred timing, right? I mean, I'm sure that's something. It's just, yeah. it's going to happen when it's, it's going to be a windfall eventually. I always have that in the back of my brain where I'm like, there's going to be 
we're going to be sitting around one day and it's just going to be. Whoosh. Oh, that happened. It's just, it's going to happen. <laughs> and you go, wow, that wasn't there. You know, and then it shows up. Right. Uh, and and uh, it, this brings up to mind something I've been thinking about a lot for the last couple of months because of where we're at right now. Mm. And uh, I read in a Rudolf Steiner book years ago that uh, when the world goes into hibernation, he was talking about the Northern Hemisphere, but it happens in the Southern Hemisphere as well. It's just in the opposite time, right? The Northern Hemisphere, the uh, hibernation is kind of like a return to a primordial dreamtime energy state, right? Mm -hmm. So it happens. The, all the animals go to sleep. All the plants go to sleep. We don't, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're at a synchrony. It's true. We're at wow. a synchronization. Yeah, we're yeah. not synchronized to the what circadian rhythms, if you want to call it that, yeah. to the rhythms of the universe. So the people that I've been working with, you know, everybody wants solstice and equinox, blah, 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 but they want the exact moment. But that's linear thinking. Mm -hmm. You have to go nonlinear, random axis, circular thinking, you know? And so... For 30 some odd years, we've been doing solstice equinox ceremonies and everybody wants to know the exact moment of mm. the solstice. And I'm going, I, start, I do some research, right? So the earth at the equator spins at 24,000 miles an hour, right? That's how fast the earth is spinning on its axis. Going and spinning mm. around the sun is something like 65,000 miles an hour. That's how fast we're traveling through <laughs> on the Earth doing yeah. orbit. And then the solar system moves at some outrageous speed through the galaxy, right? So the exact moment, it's, <laughs> it doesn't freaking matter. It's a, it's a relationship to a process in motion. Right. If we don't move, right, if the Earth didn't turn, one side would be completely frozen and one side would be completely charred. And we're at, this is where we are at right now as human beings. There's a part of us that's polarized because it's not in motion. Mm. It's not in relationship. And is it because we're not spinning or is it because we have amnesia? So yeah. our job is to mm. wake up and get that, those aspects that are polarized or uh, are not cognitive, not aware of each other in relationship. And to me, this is part of the, uh, the challenge of these times, you know? Yeah. And, this mm. is, and we're at a synchronization. Like the people that I was working with, you know, I said, okay, you're going to go through, but I want you to follow the, tr they, they do a solstice ceremony or equinox ceremony in five minutes, boom, they're on their way. They're coming from somewhere on their way to somewhere when they do this ceremony. And I said, I want you to mimic the path of the earth. So I want you to slowly go and descend into dark, to the peak of the dark, follow. So for six months, I want them to track their relationship to how the days get shorter to the, to the shortest day of the year, to the, slow, to the longest day of the year, all the way to the solstice, right? What would it be if you were in synchronized, if you were synchronized to the movements of the earth at that time? Then you have a whole different relationship you know, that you're tracking, right? Yeah, that's true. And this is what you want. That's so, yeah. the the last thing I want to ask you, and you 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 sort of put it beautifully before, but I'll ask it. You know, uh, actually, moment. John, if you can, no, please go for it. I, there was a question I wanted to ask that I felt was important. Yeah, please. Sometimes when I talk to men or women like you have had so many different life paths that just seem to, and obviously your experience of them on the ground in the moment was probably different than I'm perceiving them as a listener of the story, but just that they seem to flow from point to point. Um, and for a lot of people, it's hard to imagine that. A lot of people stick there. They have the, a thing that they do. That's the thing they do. That's the thing they identify with. And for the rest of their life, they'll fight whether it serves them or not to be good at it and to stay in that zone, in that place, doing that thing. Um, and then there's people like you who just inspire me so much when you're constantly changing up the way you're doing things. And it seems fearless. And I'm not sure if that if that is the, if that is the word, but is it, is it, I, I found that, um, when life changes drastically and I go with the flow, it's because I'm okay with like when things are necessity. When th when there's necessity, I learn quickly. Um, but otherwise, sometimes I struggle to be to think like, oh, this isn't actually serving me anymore. Why can't I just let it go and move on to the next thing? Um, so, do you feel like you carried with you throughout your life a general sense of fearlessness, and where do you think that came from, or is it just necessity that moved you to the next thing? Um, that's a very complex question, but I'll try to give you a... Sure, yeah, I mean... A, it's a learning process. It's always learning. And to me, one of the things that I decided about three or four years ago, uh, there's a very common uh, saying in, here in the United States that says you can... Old dogs don't learn new tricks. 
my saying is I'm going to get to be a real old dog because I can learn new tricks. Mm -hmm. So the thing is to learn, constantly learn, and you have to adapt. In music, there's a thing called transposing. You sure. know, when you mm -hmm. change keys, yeah. right? And so you can play a tune in 12 different ways or 24 different ways, depending on how you look at it. And then you start adding musical styles. Yeah. So the way to morph something is, is pretty practical. So I had to do a very serious career change when I had to give up a music career that was fairly, you know, like, okay. And I had to go do something else because I had to feed my family. And I, and I hated it for years, you know. Mm. I, was, I resented it. I felt like I was in prison. Mm -hmm. And then I had an epiphany. I was working on a film with a friend of mine. We were walking around Chaco Canyon, and I had an epiphany. I realized all the skills that I have as a musician, I've, I've, I've trans, uh, translated them into, into film and television. And I'm going, oh, yeah. What's the freaking difference? There's no difference, you know? <laughs> I'm just as happy. There's a great yeah. Art Crumb cartoon uh, where Mr. Natural, is called Mr. Natural Does the Dishes. And he gets enlightened by doing dishes, you know? <laughs> mm. There's no words in it. It's just him doing the dishes. And at the very end, he holds up a glass and there's a star in the glass and a star in his eyes and a star in the sky or something like that, you know? And you realize enlightenment can come anyway. Mm. All you have to be is to be open, but you have to be able to transpose. So the sure. art of transposing and adapting to the circumstances at a core, if you, if you operate from source, Right? All the time. And mm -hmm. that's, this is key. If you go to the source all the time, it doesn't matter what you do. You could be cooking. You could be writing poetry. You could be writing a novel. You could be just driving yeah. down the street. Mm -hmm. And as, always, as long as you're always connected to source, then you'll never be compromised in whatever it is you're mm -hmm. doing. That's and true. That, that sort of fluidity, the ego has to go a little bit to the side and the personality and, and, and your, um, your expectations have to get down. A friend of mine had a saying, expectation is premeditated resentment. Right? Mm. And so you have to be able to put down your expectations. It's down. resistance. It's just, resistance. Yeah, yeah, it's resist just that. Right. Well, you know what the Borg say, right? Resistance is futile human, right? So <laughs> <laughs> we resist, but we should not resist. We should participate. Part yeah. So participation, yeah. I think that answers your question. It does, yeah. yeah. It's, getting, it's getting stuck on the, the way something should look, right. really. Yeah. yeah. NATO, yeah. right? And it's, not it's asinine. It means nothing. Yeah. Say that again. NATO. NATO not attached to outcome. I stole <laughs> that from somebody. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> here we are no. pirating information. No, right? no. So, I, yeah. but we're too, but we're learning at the same time. Yeah. I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you for. You always, to me, that's, the that's moment great. you stop learning, that's when you die. Mm. You know. So I'm gonna I'll be curious. Curiosity and interest will open up all kinds of doors for you, and will allow you talk about fear, right? Curiosity and interest will it will allow you to get through fear, mm. and it doesn't mean mm. I, I've been through. I've done all kinds of things in my life, and and I'm I'm terrified sometimes, you know. Sure. And I, but I I sing I sing. You, you know, take it I, with you. I, yeah. Take it with you, and take you realize, oh, yeah. this is how I deal with my fear. Yeah. And it's the, and what I've learned how to do with my fear is I want my fear to bring me information. I've made fear a scout for me, right? Fear can bring you tons of information, so you just to reassign. You have to give fear a different assignment. Mm -hmm. You know, don't feed it, but put it to work for you, you know, and all of a sudden it could be a great scout, bring you yeah. all kinds of information, you know, so that I would say you have to change or it'll still be there, but you just have to make it work for you instead of being dominated by it, you know. Right. Mm. So. And it's yes. probably meant to be a tool. Yeah. 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 Right, it's got to be. Yeah. You yeah. have to use all those things. That's fascinating. I feel yeah. like I don't want to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that the last uh, question we got to ask. No, we got to ask the last question. Um, Simply put, when you hear the word wolf, what comes to your mind? Uh, fierce. Fierce is one of them. And the other one is just uh, the ability to, uh, to rise up to challenges, right? And, and be able to overcome challenges, you know, no matter how difficult the circumstances is, is to be able to develop wits and creatively get into a situation where you... So you become like... A wolf is like a catalytical element that allows mm. you to transform, to morph whatever situation you're in. I so. love that. That's amazing. <laughs> Miguel, this has been yeah, huge, incredible. hugely incredible, Beautiful. informative, amazing. You're an amazing individual. Thank you so much for coming here and, you know, gracing us with your story and all the things that you do. Thank you for the work that you do. 
Um, is there anything, any websites that we can point people to, any social media, anything where the people can look at the work that you do and see what the deal is? Right now, they're, everything is being developed because developed, it's current. Okay. So if people have questions, they can email you and mm-hmm. they and I'll answer questions or, and direct them to whatever. Yeah. They, they email you and then you can email me. We'll sure. That way. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we'll yeah. put that up. Um, you know, if you guys, we'll, we'll put the email in our, in the, the podcast description. If you guys have any questions you want to ask Miguel, or how you want to get in touch with him and the teachings that he does, we'll, we'll forward yeah. that to him and we'll get you connected with him. He's- and to me, one of the huge pieces on this is all education. And for me, one of the long-term goals is to have Wolf Connection be a center where we could teach people right. all kinds of things, in relationship to the land, relationship to animals, relationship to agriculture, to the world, because this is what it's about. Right. It's being able to course correct at this point. So this is the long-term goal. Exactly. So it's yeah, make- it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Gonna happen. We're going to get there. We're going to get through. We're going to get through this. Uh, what's going on right now with yeah. around the world, and we're going to we're going to forge forward. And, and people will need it more than ever. Right. Wanted. And yeah. you'll obviously Miguel will be a part of it. So Miguel Rivera, Love thank it. you so much. You're very welcome. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. How's to all of you out there? And we will speak with you all next time. Bye, everyone. Bye.